Hello again and welcome to lecture three. Today we'll be talking about layer masks. In this video, we're gonna cover selections, channels, and masks. Very similar concepts. They're definitely related to each other, but we'll go through in detail a little bit about that. Before we do though, let's talk a little bit, or I suppose I should say review some of the selection things that we talked about before. Um, I don't think I mentioned the terminology that gets used frequently about marquees or marquee selections, and that is marching ants. If you don't know what that is already, just to make sure that we get that out of the way, marching ants is what you see around a selections border. It's that dashed or dotted line that appears to be moving or blinking. Um, literally, people call it marching ants. That's what you'll find in the documentation of Photoshop. So if that slips up, if I say that, that's what I'm talking about. Um, adding to and modifying a selection, that's an important thing to remember how to do. You can do that in a variety of different ways with the buttons in the options panel or by using keyboard shortcuts, typically Shift and Alt work well for that. Um, modifying those, again, hold down the anchor points when you create, the, or hold down the constraints, Shift and Alt when you're creating them, and you can transform a selection and all that good stuff. So anyways, go back to the previous lesson and review that if you want to. We're gonna jump into a topic called Quick Mask now. Quick Mask, just to throw back a little bit to the past of graphic design, was done using something similar to what you see when you enter quick mask mode in Photoshop. It's this red or pink kind of uh, salmon colored overlay that de defines for um, various purposes what is hidden and what's not. So in the old days, the reason that they use this red film, as you can see in those images, it's a kind of a sticky film that got applied onto it. It's called rubylith tape or film and that allowed designers to lay out their designs. Um, so it, you can hopefully get the idea from the images there, but those that tape would block the light that's used to expose the film that was burned when you exposed a plate for printing. Um, not much printing is done that way anymore, or plates aren't burned that way anymore. Printing is still done using the same technology a lot of the, way, a lot of the time, but plates aren't made that way anymore quite so much. However, um, that kind of persisted as a, uh, a leftover in Photoshop. The quick mask mode is definitely pink like that. So um, <laughs> you may not call that pink. Just so you know, I don't call colors by the right names, hardly ever. All right, anyway, moving on. What a quick mask mode is, or quick mask in general, is just a visual representation of what you have selected. Um, it's, it's turned on very easily by uh, several different methods, but the fastest is the keyboard shortcut. There's a button at the bottom of the tool panel as well, but just click Q on the keyboard and that's gonna toggle quick mask. When you have a selection, then it's gonna show you that ruby lith colored overlay over everything that's outside of your selection. It's like a mask saying that whatever you do is only going to affect the area that is not masked out in Ruby. So that's very helpful for seeing things that you can't see with just those marching ants. Things like opacity of your selection as that, that uh, density of your selection changes, you can modify that. You'll see that much more easily with a Ruby overlay in the quick mask mode. Feathered edges on your selection too. Same thing, very difficult to visualize how much feathering you have on a selection if you're just using the marching ants as an indicator. Um, the other cool thing about when you're in the quick mask mode is that you don't have to just use selection tools to work with your selection then. It's like a layer of actual film over the top of a document. You can modify that in a lot of different ways. In Photoshop, that means you can use the brush, eraser, gradients, lots of other selection techniques to modify that. And uh, you have a lot more functionality as far as how refined you can make your selection. You can actually make your selection using the paintbrush tool, for example in Photoshop. That's a cool thing, anyway. <laughs> All right, so jumping on, this is what it looks like. So in A, the butterfly there is kind of roughly outlined with a, probably the magnetic lasso tool. Then the user clicks Q on the keyboard and you see B is showing you what looks like a red or ruby overlay over that image, matching the edges of the selection. Now, um, in the channels panel, that you can see there. You'll notice that there's a new channel at the bottom called Quick Mask. We'll talk about channels a little bit more here on the next slide actually. But for now, just know that when you create, when you enter Quick Mask mode, you get a new channel there. And that is 
kind of the basis of how selections and masking, which we'll talk about later, how that works in Photoshop is using channels. On the right, you just see some other ideas of what you can do with a quick mask, painting it in with your brush or whatever. You can also change the color of that overlay so it's not ruby. Some um, subject matter may be easier to visualize if it's a different or more contrasting color to what you're making a selection of. Um, it's good to know that quick mask is there. If anything, just because every so often you'll accidentally hit Q, you'll try to do something and it won't work because you're in quick mask mode. So just remember that's one thing to keep an eye out for. Check that as Q. All right. Um, here's what you'll use a lot more. Channels and then after this we'll get into masking. So think back to what we talked about before in that last lecture about uh, digital imaging, binary, um, bit depth, about uh, how many shades of gray there are in an 8-bit image, all that stuff. Hopefully that's ringing some bells. Um, so an 8-bit image has 255 possible brightness values. An 8-bit color image has 255 brightness values for red, green, and blue. That's if it's an RGB image. If you calculate that out, that is about 16.5 million possible combinations. So that's what you get with a monitor. It's a 24-bit monitor. You'll, you'll see 24-bit color. That's where it comes from, is 8 to the 3rd or 3 to the 8th or whatever. I don't know. I'm not a mathematician. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Anyways, you got a lot of color combinations there. Now, we're not even getting into, in this class, high bit depth images, like 10, 12, 14, 16-bit images, where you have exponentially more possible combinations of color and tones. But for our purposes, just remember that if you add more red, more green, and more blue, you get a brighter color. If all those values are equal, then you get gray or black or white or something in between. Uh, that's what we call neutral. So that third bullet point, the brightness of each channel, determines what color it is. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense when you look at the channel here. I put a simple rainbow gradient down on an image and then clicked on the channels panel and you see red is pretty dark through the areas where there's green, cyan, and blue. There's not much red that needs to be used to generate those colors. So the, the red channel matches. In the green channel, the areas where there's red are pretty black. And then green obviously is bright and blue has a lot of green to generate it. Um, and then blue, same thing. The warmer tones are dark on that blue channel's thumbnail. Play around with some different images in Photoshop and look at the channels panel and you'll start to get the idea. Um, also, go into the color picker in Photoshop. Just click on that little color chip over the left-hand side at the bottom of the toolbar and you can see, play around, click on different colors with your cursor and look at the values for red, green, and blue. And you'll see those change as you get brighter and darker. And you'll start to get the idea. Type in numbers for that and it'll start to make even more sense. I'll post a link in our Facebook group or the discussion board, depending on your class, where you can uh, play a game. It's just this little game online to test your color knowledge. And it'll display a set of colors and ask you to guess what are the RGB values of that color. It's uh, a lot easier than you think. You, it starts to make sense and you start to understand really quickly how these colors combine together. But that's what channels are. So channels are simply grayscale brightness values that represent different colors. And we don't get color until we combine them. Um, alpha channels are a kind of a channel that doesn't have any color information. It doesn't represent any color, it just stores uh, selection information as a grayscale image. So if we were to make a mask, a quick mask, a selection, a marquee, whatever, and then add it as a mask, a layer mask, I'm using a lot of terminology here that can get confusing. I'm sorry, I hope it'll, it'll clear up in a minute. But if we make a mask and then we go to the channels panel, we'll see now there is a mask down there at the bottom, alpha one and two and so on. We can add these alpha channels. So an alpha channel is like the text says here, an extra channel added to an image that stores your selection information as a grayscale picture. So you can create alpha channels and you can duplicate them, you can save them, you can copy them, you can do all kinds of stuff with them. You can modify them just like quick mask, but unlike the quick mask mode, which you tab hit Q again and it's gone, 
alpha channels stick around and you can do a lot of other things with it. So let's look at what some of those are. So a layer mask is one kind of an alpha channel, but specifically it only applies to, or it can apply to a single layer. So by tagging it to a single layer, we can mask out or hide certain areas of an image so that they're not showing. This is really useful when we talk about non-destructive workflow in Photoshop. So a destructive way to remove the sky of a background would be to select it painstakingly and use the eraser tool or the delete key and just nuke those pixels and throw them away. They're gone. Um, that may work for some scenarios, but it may not work for others. Let's say that it doesn't work out quite right and you don't notice until later that there was an error made. You erase something that shouldn't have been and it's gone permanently. You don't have enough undos in your history to get back to it and you're out of luck. Um, so destructive edits like that are troublesome. Working non-destructively, you could make the same excellent selection of the sky in that image and apply a layer mask. What that's going to do is it's going to hide all the blue sky or whatever it is that you're selecting. It's just going to hide it. It's going to mask it out. And then it still remains. It's still there. So if you need to modify that, you can go back in and just modify your mask, paint on it with the paintbrush tool or apply a gradient to it or refine your selection or any number of other things. So um, key things, I'm going to read each of these bullet points just for emphasis, but these are important things to remember about layer masks is that they can be edited directly. You can use almost any tool in Photoshop to edit your layer masks. You can save them and use them again. You can copy them. You can apply them to multiple groups of images or multiple layers or um, lots of layer, one layer mask to lots of different layers or to a single layer, or you can even apply them to adjustment layers and other things. You can, um, well, I think that pretty much covers it, <laughs> but, but keep in mind if on an assignment, this is just a pro tip for you to get the most points possible on your assignments. If it comes down to erasing something or deleting something and using a layer mask, you'll always get more points by using the layer mask. So if that's motivation or whatever for you, I hope that helps, but you'll find as you start to use it more and more, it really is a better way of working in Photoshop to use layer masks than to destructively erase or delete. Vector masks are just another kind of layer mask. It's just how they're made. Uh, and that is using vector tools within Photoshop rather than uh, pixel based tools like the brush. So if we use the shape tools or the pen tool or text or type, I mean, we can, we can create a vector mask. We can also create or repurpose complex illustrations from other programs like Illustrator and bring those in and, and convert them to a vector mask, which can be pretty helpful for creating nice, clean, sharp masks. Um, a lot of benefits to that. We'll, you'll learn more about vectors when you get to that section, but just keep in mind that Photoshop does support vectors in a lot of areas and, and vector masks are a useful thing. Clipping mask um, doesn't work quite the same way as the other masks that we talked about, but it shares the name mask. So we're gonna talk about that a little, little bit here real quick. A clipping mask in the layers panel, you'll see what it looks like. The potatoes layer is on top of the other layer and there's a little arrow pointing out from the left and down. That means it is clipped to the layer below. And hopefully you can see by the image what's going on there. That logo image of a tree or a broccoli or whatever that is, I don't know, um, is actually being knocked out or it's knocking out the image of the potatoes behind it or in front of it or on top of it. However you want to describe that, that's the effect. So you can apply a clipping mask to layers. You can apply them with adjustments. You can apply them with all kinds of stuff. Um, just be aware that that's what a clipping mask is. Okay, channel masking. This is just basically another way of creating a layer mask or a mask in general. It's all kind of the same thing, just a different way of going about doing it. So you can uh, create a channel mask in a, in a couple different ways. One way that I like to use is just duplicate one of the channels. Let's say that I'm selecting uh, somebody's wearing a, a bright red shirt and I want to change the color of that shirt. There's a lot of the different ways to do this in Photoshop. So those of you that know what you're doing, don't, don't say, oh, I wouldn't do it that way. I get it. <laughs> this is just an example. 
So anyways, let's say you want to select something this bright red. You could select the red channel or look at some of the other channels and see whatever has the most contrast. In those channels, one of the layers, that shirt's going to be bright white or dark black and everything else is going to be opposite. And starting from that point, you're going to be able to make a nicer, easier selection sometimes, depending on subject material. There are a lot of different ways to use channels that are more complex. You can make also a luminosity mask really easily by using channels to select very quickly uh, certain brightness values within an image. I have an action that if you ask me nicely, I'll share this action with you. And you run that action and it'll create a luminosity mask from your channels for every possible brightness value throughout the image. And all you gotta do is click on the values and, and you can select whether you want the dark darks or the kind of dark darks or the really, really dark darks or whatever, any range of brightness values throughout the whole image. And it works great for really refined color edits and uh, color toning. All right, um, so important concept. I just have one concept here. <laughs> Masks are non-destructive, and this is the one time you'll see me add animation to a slide. And I even added a little the more you know star here because I want to drive this point home, as silly as it is, that masks are non-destructive. It's something that is very important. If you take nothing else away from this class, non-destructive is how to go in Photoshop. It'll save you lots of headaches and sweating and all kinds of stuff. So work non-destructively whenever you can, and using layer masks is a big way to do that. So that's it for this lecture. We'll pick it up on Lecture 3B and talk about some other stuff there.